So Lydia, the merchant of purple cloth. Now most of us are not called by our first name and then our descriptive title when someone speaks to us or refers to us. In history, though, we have people like Alexander the Great, Mary, Queen of Scots, and today we have Chance the Rapper. Perhaps Lydia was a popular name in Greece and Turkey, and you know, back then, uh, last names hadn't even come into play yet. And so this could have distinguished Lydia the merchant from Lydia the baker's wife. I don't know. But there's something I do know. You know, this is not Lydia, the tattooed lady that you know from the Muppet movie, (laughs) okay? I learned about that from uh, Julian, our second hour um, bass player, and that was last week's lesson for me after church. But being a successful businesswoman is not so amazing today in this 21st century, but during Lydia's day, it would have been uncommon. And, may, and we may find it odd for someone to gain wealth from selling cloth, and in particular, the purple cloth. Why purple? Well, purple was a status symbol back then, and the purple cloth was reserved for the elite. Only the emperor wore a toga made entirely of purple cloth, and the elite could afford purple trim on their garments. The main reason purple cloth was so uh, expensive was that the process that was needed to create this purple dye. Thousands of mollusks were required to dye a single yard of cloth. You who sew know what a yard of cloth is and can imagine just how many mollusks it would take to make a, a garment. Purple dye was derived from the mucus of this shellfish. This shellfish was especially prominent where Lydia, from her hometown of Thyatira, a city that was 250 miles southeast of the Greek city of Philippi. This shellfish produced a deep purple violet that unlike all other, claw, other colors was color fast. So togas and other fancy garments could be washed. The whole process to extract the ink was a long drawn out procedure. As I was reading this, I was like, this is even longer than taking the cocoa bean to the, uh, you know, the, the, the chocolate get in the store. It was very long, and you can look that up. I found it very fascinating that one gram of pure dye was worth 10 grams of gold. And a pound of wool dye from the favored purple could be sold for 1,000 denarii, which is like a whole lot of money, and it's a whole, um, it takes three years for a laborer to earn 1,000 denarii. So you know why laborers weren't going around in purple. You and I would not be hanging out in purple back then. A whole cloak made of purple dye might cost three times that amount, so about nine years' worth of work. Lydia had an export business moving purple dyed cloth from Thyatira to Philippi, a Roman colony. The Romans were known to show off their wealth by using purple and scarlet for their tunics and togas. So Lydia would have had plenty of customers. Although she was born and raised to believe in the gods and goddesses of Thyatira, Lydia didn't worship the pantheon of gods from her hometown. Somehow, at some point in her life, Lydia took the major step away from her religious upbringing and was drawn to the Jewish claims of one god and became a God-fearer, or as our scripture translates today, a God-worshipper. Now, Philippi didn't have a synagogue, and it seems that back in those days, the towns and cities away from Jerusalem, when they didn't have a synagogue, they would um, meet in small prayer groups, 
And uh, so the Jewish folk would gather there. And in this case, Lydia joined a group of women for prayer down by the riverside each Sabbath. This is where missionary Paul and his companions met her. It was customary for Paul and his traveling companions to worship in the town synagogue where they visited. But when he uh, inquired about a synagogue, they said, hey, there's some folks that pray down by the river. Maybe you could join them. And Lydia and the women welcomed Paul and his companions. Now, Paul, being Paul, gave witness to the good news of Jesus Christ during this prayer meeting. And upon hearing Paul's message, Lydia is moved. Her spirit is moved to believe. And she and her whole household, her servants, all her children, were baptized. Lydia and her household became the first Christian converts in Philippi. Lydia offers hospitality to Paul and his ministry team that comprised of Silas, Timothy, and the writer Luke to stay in her home. So here's another sign of her wealth. Lydia must have had a larger than average home for her to accommodate these extra people and later to have the church that she led to gather there. Church historians believe her home was a Roman-style house with an atrium and ample space for the church to worship. So why do we include Lydia in our stories of faith? You know, this summer we looked at nine bold, untold stories of faith. Folks who embodied their belief, internalized what they believed, But that didn't stop there. They gave life to their belief. We met midwives like Shipra and Pua who believed that a nationality of people who were different than themselves were worth saving. And so these midwives, along with their other midwives that worked with them, uh, risked their lives by saving male Hebrew babies from death. We met Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, young men who refused to follow the laws of the land when the laws went against God's laws. We met the Ethiopian eunuch whose faith was so deep and wide that even though society pushed him to the margins, it didn't dampen his eagerness to learn more about God's love. So what about Lydia? She is an outsider. She's not a man, and yet she is a prominent woman in her society. Nor is she Jewish, but she is influential within her own community. As a person of faith, she puts her beliefs into practice and uses her gifts, her wealth, and her leadership skills for the betterment of others. Kathleen Norris writes in her book, Amazing Grace, that only people who are at home in themselves can offer hospitality. Lydia, the merchant, seems to know who she is. And as Luke tells it further on in this chapter, hospitality naturally oozes from her. A prayer group gathers in her home when Paul and Silas are sent to prison. And when they are released, they find shelter there. And later, she leads a growing church in her home, which which we learn from Paul's supervisory letter, the Philippians, the book of Philippians. As you read that book, any time that you sit down with that, think about Lydia, the church leader of, of uh, of the Philippian church. Paul says to them, No church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. This church continually blessed Paul and others. And this church at Philippi existed because of Lydia's generous heart and welcoming spirit. She knew how to extend hospitality. 
From the beginning of time, we learn of God's desire to bless us so that we can bless others. In our psalm today, we see how God is blessed when we bless one another. In Revelation, the vision of the new Jerusalem is a gift of God's hospitality offered to all nations, providing security, healing, and food. We aren't given gifts and talents so that we get glory for them. We don't work to improve our talents and gifts only to be benefit ourselves. We are created with natural gifts and we then learn our trades that fulfill our passions. We become better merchants, we become better teachers, we become better nurses and doctors, we become better at the cash register, we become better humans for the betterment of the whole world. We can think that hospitality is just for certain types of people. That it's just a gift for others. And yet Lydia, the new convert, immediately understood that a life of following Christ is a life of hospitality. Hospitality is essentially the offer of safety, comfort, nourishment, and friendship to both friend and stranger. What this means for us initially is to open our hearts to see the stranger, the person who is different from us, who speaks differently than we do, who believes differently than we do, who loves differently than we do, to see them like one of us, a child of God. And then we will welcome the stranger as a friend, offering safety, comfort, and love. Matthew Fox suggests in his book, Original Blessing, that the true meaning of holiness is hospitality. As we open ourselves to see one another as children of God and welcome one another, this overflows into practical hospitality to open our communities, our churches, our neighborhoods, and yes, even our literal homes to those who need shelter, safety, nourishment, acceptance, and friendship. Lydia, the merchant of purple cloth, is also Lydia, the woman with a welcoming heart. So what about you and me? Can we carry out God's work through Jesus to be known as ones who welcome one another and welcome the stranger? I place candles around Lydia's picture to represent hospitality because you and I are called to be the light of the world, to be light that welcomes to guide the way, to be light that heals, to be light that listens. My prayer is that we don't hold on to and hide who we are. We don't put our gifts under the bushel, so to speak, but we are freely giving and sharing of the gifts like Lydia did, sharing her resources so all can feel God's love and grace. Amen.